to the Word of God together this morning. We're continuing our series, Soul Detox, Rhythms of Reformation for Weary Souls. And if I'm not met you, my name is Brett. So good to be together this morning. I've really enjoyed this series as just been thinking about how we easily do drift towards being distracted, busy, weary, and how actually we do need some rhythms and practices and habits that help to reform um, our souls and where we're at and who we want to be. And so we've been talking about that each week. And wasn't last week so rich when we talked about Sabbath? I loved how Nuver and Donna led in, in that, talking about Sabbath. Sure, clap, go for it. Yeah. I love how Sabbath, that's resisting weariness, how God gives us this example and this instruction to have a rhythm in our week, in our week that resets us and helps us to reform that He is God, that we can rest, and that we can just be. And today I want to talk about hospitality, how hospitality resists loneliness. And so we want to talk about that this morning. What, let me ask a question. What is hospitality? When you think about hospitality, how would you describe or define it? Shout it out. Open arms, open heart, open home. <laughs> open arms, open heart, open home. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Really good food. <laughs> really good food? Okay. Yeah. Just like sharing your life a little bit. Connection, sharing your life. Great. Caring for somebody. Caring for somebody, yeah. Yeah, the word that we see in Scripture is coming, uh, it's coming out of the original language, really speaking to love, the love or befriending of a stranger. To love or befriend a stranger. That's the idea of hospitality. And so when we, when we dive into uh, the Word of God, as we're going to see a few verses today, we see this as a theme, that this is important to God's heart. It's important for His people to love or befriend the stranger, which involves open arms, open a heart, open home, care, compassion, food, these types of things. How do we be a people of hospitality. How does a rhythm of hospitality actually help to reform us? I don't know if you, there was a movie a few years ago. I listened to the audio book about a, a SEAL team that went into the mountains of Af Afghanistan to find um, a member of the Taliban. And they were actually discovered and went under heavy attack. So this, the SEALs, which is, I think the SEALs are just an incredible this is incredible. It's so fascinating to me. I don't know if you ever see their documentaries and things on Hell Week and what they go through, but I'm fascinated by that. But they send in a rescue helicopter that ends up getting shot down, and there is one lone seal left who runs through the mountains trying to escape all of the Taliban. It's a sniper. His name is Marcus Luttrell. And he ends up running to a village, and the vi this, guy, this member in the village brings him in helps protect him, and the village sends a runner to the nearest army base in the area, which is a ways away, to try to find help. In the meantime, the villagers band together to actually hold off the Taliban and to, to protect Marcus Luttrell. And so this, the, one, his, the one man, I made a note of, of his name here, Mohammed Gulab is the one man who found him, who welcomes him in. Now, you think about hospitality, befriending a stranger, open heart, open, open home. Um, that's a bit of an extreme example. Like, I don't know that any of us have probably extended hospitality in that type of extent, where you're actually putting your life on the line to protect somebody. Why? Why would they do that? And so I was reading an article about this a few years ago. And they said that, actually, the, what had happened is that because this, this village of people, the, the Pushtun people, they have an ancient code. They have an ancient code, uh, Pushtun Wali, I think I'm probably mispronouncing it, but this is the idea, which can be pronounced the way of the Pushtuns, which includes hospitality and bravery. And so when Mark Luttrell, who's running away from the Taliban, ends up coming to Muhammad Gulab, he welcomes him in and understands that he has a cultural code, an ancient obligation. This is the way of the, push, the Pushtun people to welcome him in with bravery and hospitality, even to protect him. And they ended up becoming 
becoming friends and stayed friends for years later, and uh, Marcus Luttrell ends up getting rescued. And just this radical story of hospitality. This is the way. Now, I'm not sure if you're watching The Mandalorian at all, any of you, but th there's some, and we see a little bit of, of, of hospitality in there, but this is the way. So if you're a follower of Jesus here today, in our context, we do not have examples or obligations culturally to have radical hospitality like that, do we? Um, never mind risking our life, just the idea of, of, of the bathroom not being clean enough or, or just having a tiring week would hold us back from opening our home to somebody. Just the concept that maybe it'll involve an awkward conversation would hold us back from welcoming a stranger. And never mind that, that I might have to face uh, face a band of angry warriors coming that will actually maybe wipe out my whole village if I welcome them in. And so I was thinking about this story and then thinking about maybe we don't have a cultural obligation in our day, but if we're apprentices of Jesus, if we're his disciples, we actually have a call, the way of Jesus, which is a way of hospitality. It's actually higher than a cultural obligation. Um, who's, who he is, what he has done, and what he invites us into. And so thinking through, through that, another question, when have you experienced generous or radical hospitality? Most of us have not experienced anything close to Marcus Luttrell, but what have you experienced? What comes to mind when you think about generous hospitality? Okay. We have friends that you don't really know that well. Okay. Yeah, traveling overseas, being welcomed in. <clears throat> if you're on Zoom watching, you can go ahead and throw your yeah, answers in the chat. When I throw this out, what's an example of radical or generous hospitality? Thanks, Paul. Anyone else? The people who don't have the means. Mm. Like traveling, and there's people that don't have the means, but they open up hospitality. Yeah. Yeah, when we went to visit our global partners in Costa Rica three years ago, I remember going to visit a family where. Uh, a tree had just fallen on and crashed their house, which was a two-bedroom hut with no floor. And, uh, and so they, they, the, they said that the church had just come to repair the roof a few days earlier, and you could see all the remnants of it. And so we drove by to say hi to, say hi to them and with, the, with the missionaries on the ground there. This was in this, who are working in the reserves of Costa Rica. And so we come in and we're saying, we're saying hi, and they introduce us. We can, of course, um, communicate with them, but they, they basically bring out coffee to us and offer us lunch, and they're coming here, and my, my, my son Matthias is like, looks inside, and he's like, um, we can't go in the house because there's not really any space, and they're cleaning up the rubble, but he's also like, dad, their, their house doesn't have a floor, and I was like, yeah, no, it's true, different people live differently, buddy, and he's like, but then we were driving away, he's like, but then they offered us, we didn't, we didn't receive lunch, but we received their, um, their, their coffee, and he, and he said, but they are offering us food. Shouldn't we be giving them food? And I said, well, isn't that the, isn't that the irony of hospitality? Oh, yeah. Anyone else? Just like the incredible open arms welcome, and they'll just do anything that they could mm. to make sure that you were comfortable before that mm. they would even think about themselves. Mm. It was really hard to receive, actually. But. <laughs> yeah. Why, why, jumping off that, why do you think it could be hard for us to receive radical hospitality in certain contexts? I, I could relate to that. Because we're not used to giving it. Okay. We're not used to receiving it. Yeah. Okay. And, and so why do you think it could be hard to receive? Mm. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. So it makes it feel difficult. Yeah. Okay. You can't repay it. Right. We don't want to owe anyone. Interesting. Okay. Pride as well. You want to be seen to be the one giving. Right. Some pride is involved. Involved. So it's interesting, right? You go to a different context where maybe they feel like there's not very much means, but there's a lot of extension. Then there's a sense of, well, I can't, I can't take that because, because I have so much, or, or I don't, I haven't earned it. I don't deserve it. I can't, 
I can't, it's not, I don't know how to repay it. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing when we think about, when we start to think about life through the lens of the gospel. Um, and I think, I've been thinking about God's grace lately, which we, if you're a follower of Jesus, you know, probably in a theological idea, God's grace is that we receive what we don't earn. We don't deserve. And so I think if you're a follower of Jesus, you hear this, you understand this at an intellectual level. Yes, I've received from God what I don't deserve and I have not earned. But then practically, to receive from somebody else what I have not earned or don't deserve feels so difficult. It's like I can't, I can't receive it. I'm not good at receiving, which is so interesting because I remember going to visit um, some mentors in Fresno, California with their church. And they, that was the most, the most radical Western hospitality that I've received. Like, literally, he picks it up from the airport, and they actually, um, they actually gave us some cash. He's like, well, you're here. Uh, you don't, like, if you want to go for a nice dinner with your wife, if you, go, if you need something, some school supplies for your kids, I don't know what you need, but there's some money. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, you can't just give us, who gives you money when you show up to visit? And they're like, there you go. And then it just kept on unfolding. It was like, oh, tomorrow night, these people, these leaders, these elders from our church are hosting you. And you go over there, and it's just like this, this crazy feast. And I'm like, we get on saying, like, we can't, no, no, you, you, should, you can't do, like, you don't have to do this. You're, we're already staying with you for free. We're learning from you all day. You're praying over us. Like, it's enough. And it was just like, if you, can, if you say you can, and at some point it was like, if you say that you can receive the death of God's Son, to rescue you from your sins without deserving it at all. If you can receive that, why can't you receive some money from us or a good meal? Like, is your, is your pride in independence that deep? And I was like, whoo, gospel bomb on my soul. But there's something there. Hey, it's easy to say, oh, I'll, I received that. But then in a self-sufficient, self-reliant, independent, um, self-focused or prideful way of being, suddenly now hospitality is not just actually maybe resisting loneliness. Maybe hospitality is resisting pride. 1 Peter 4. If you've got your Bible, open that up there and let's look, let's look at this. <clears throat> Now, Peter is writing to Christians who are facing challenges in the first century. This is Peter, who was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And they're facing persecution. They've been scattered. This is probably a regional letter that's been distributed around. And so he's talking to them in light of, we're all facing such difficulties. Let's persevere in faith. Let's be the church. Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Pause. There's a mentality amongst the early church that then has continued through generation and generation, but sometimes we forget it, that Jesus' return is imminent. That the end is, so we look at this and we say, well, this is over, this is 2,000 years ago about, that Peter writes this and he says, the end of all things is at hand. Uh, gee, but it wasn't, it wasn't true. But there was a mentality of like, you just don't know. And so there is a sense of urgency and diligence and intentionality that is necessary. Therefore, in light of that, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And so there's a posture that helps us in our prayers. Self-control, right? So having a sense of discipline um, to control myself. Uh, that if I don't have that, it's very hard. Have you, have, you, have you tried to pray lately and just find yourself wandering, getting distracted, getting bored? Like to actually control myself and focus. That posture helps my prayers. And then be sober-minded. Be thoughtful. Do this for the sake of your prayers. So we want to be a praying people. Verse 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love, what? Covers a multitude. Don't you love that? Keep loving one another earnestly, because love covers a multitude of sins. When we're in close relationship with one another, uh, it's, I was reading lately how it, it's like porcupines, that porcupines, uh, they, they, they will hurt each other if they get too close. But then when it gets cold, they want, they want to be close, so they'll huddle together, 
And then there's this tension that I think psychologists talk about this for us as human beings, the porcupine effect of do I want warmth and human relationship and intimacy? That means I'm going to get pricked. Or do I want distance and self-dependence, but then it's safe? Because now I'm not getting, and here's the thing, the more we get into relationship with one another, the more that we're going to experience one another's sins, we're going to get poked, and now that we have the opportunity to choose to love, and love, to let love cover over that, right? So as you get to know me, as you get to know me then they'll be like, okay, I have to ch I choose, I'm going to choose to love Brett, to receive the grace of God, to extend the grace of God, and to let love cover over uh, the multitude of Brett's sins. Thank you for doing that. Love one another, what's that word in there though? Love one another earnestly. In the original language, the concept is this, love at full stretch. So we don't have an English, an English concept to communicate it, so they just put earnestly. But love at full stretch. If we are to be in relationship with love, above all to love, it's going to stretch us. Then it goes on. And then in light of this, so praying, then love, love leads to showing hospitality. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So it's one thing to show hospitality in light of love at full stretch, but then, and then to choose to do that without, without grumbling. Have you ever extended some hospitality or welcomed people in and then grumbled about it a little bit? Like, I invited all these people over and now I've got to clean up their mess afterwards, and I'm up so late, no one stayed to help me. Woe is me. I'm such a martyr of love and grace. <laughs> Do it without, without grumbling. Now, can somebody look up Titus 1, 7 to 8? If, that's, if you want to volunteer for that, go, give me a shout. And then can somebody do Romans 12, 13? Who wants Titus 1, 7 to 8? Who wants Romans 12, 13? When you're ready, go for it. Titus. Nice and well. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. When the New Testament talks about the qualifications for a church overseer, in both Timothy and Titus, one of the qualifications is hospitality. That to actually be a spiritual leader in God's family means that you need to have, you need to be hospitable. Your personal life and family needs to be open to love and befriend the stranger. And that becomes actually, that's an instruction for the whole church, but a requirement to be a leader in the church because of how significant this is and how this reflects God's heart. Um, Romans 12, 13. 12, 13 or 13? 12, 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints and then continue to show hospitality. And so there's a love for one another as the people of God, as a church family, and then that overflows to the stranger, to those who are new, to those on the, the outside, so to speak. Okay, this is what I would like for you to do now. Online, you're going to be able to do this, and then in person. Um, and we're actually going to do a little, a short breakout with two questions. Groups of three or four. Um, if, if you absolutely resist this, then you can choose to keep your screen off if you're on Zoom and, or, and, and just listen. Or in person, you can reflect personally. But we'd love for us to be able to engage to one another. Two questions. We'll just continue the thought of why is hospitality, hospitality challenging for us? So we've already jumped on a little bit, but you can dive into that further. Why is hospitality challenging for us? And how do we see hospitality in the gospel, the story of Jesus? Why is hospitality challenging for us? And then really major on where do we see hospitality in the gospel, the story of Jesus? All right? I'll give you five minutes. Break. Groups of three or four. Meet somebody new if you like. Respect each other's social distance. Enjoy on Zoom.
Couple minutes left. How do you see hospitality in the gospel? And land your plane, please. All right, if you want to go back to your seats, everyone. Thoughts. 
everywhere. Like <laughs> he embodies hospitality if it's befriending a stranger. Mm. But we were talking specifically about how he called his disciples to come and see, like to come and be a part of his life. She just, right. you know, Andrew was like, "Why are you staying?" And he's like, "Come and see." Come and see. <laughs> but Jesus actually embodies hospitality. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Yeah. Any other thoughts to add to that? Paul flipped the script in terms of like receiving it. He invited himself over to the tax collector mm-hmm. Zacchaeus' house. Interesting. So he flips the script and actually invites himself over to like Zacchaeus' house. Yeah. I'm going to come to your house. Now you, you get to actually extend, extend it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Thanks. Feeding of the 5,000. Yeah. A little bit of miraculous. I'm going to feed all of you. All right. Yeah. And often the, uh, the, the uh, disciples uh, didn't want him bothered, but he was like, no, no, bring them in. Mm-hmm. Bring you the children. Now. Yeah, the little kids. Yeah. Come, yeah. come in close. Yeah, not a bother. Come on in. Yeah. Great. Thanks for that good engagement. I, years ago, read um, a theology book, Violence, Hospitality, and the Cross, and I opened it up again because I was thinking about a quote, and I was able to, to find it. And um, Hans Borsma writes this, Hospitality is not only or even primarily a human virtue, but it is a virtue that has divine origin. It is a divine virtue. As a divine virtue, it gives expression to the very character of God. Then he goes on, Human hospitality is underwritten by God's hospitality in Jesus Christ. That ultimately, beyond even the moment of Jesus welcoming a stranger in, in that context, but actually Jesus coming as God in the flesh, the ultimate story of the gospel, what he's doing, is he comes to show the hospitality of God to welcome all of us as strangers into the family of God through his person work, his death and resurrection, that we actually get to be adopted, not just welcomed over for a meal, to the Father, but adopted into the Father's family because of His hospitality of Jesus coming out to say, you are an enemy where where you're currently at, but you can become a friend and a child. Come on in. That hospitality is divine virtue. It's underwritten by Jesus, and now we get to extend that. So how do we do this together? And isn't there the added layer of of COVID and masks and different levels of fear and comfort in this time. How, which makes it all the more necessary, isn't it? Um, We live in a city that is plagued by loneliness, distraught with disconnection. How do the people of Jesus have rhythms of hospitality to love and befriend the stranger, to welcome somebody in? How do we do this? Now, some of us, when we think about hospitality, we think of amazing parties like Martha, Martha Stewart stuff or amazing food things or um, who's like the new, the new young hipster Martha Stewart like that she was on like The Bachelorette, she lives in Kelowna. Jillian Harris, yeah, my, my wife's like, oh, this new thing from Jillian Harris, right? So we're not all going to be Jillian Harris. Um, so we often can think, we can think about that, but that's not at the heart of it, right? The heart of it isn't to impress with the fanciest flavored water at a party with the right decorations. The heart of it is to welcome somebody in with love and care. I recently read or half read a book uh, that I really appreciated by Priya Parker. It's not a Christian uh, book, but it's called The Art of Gathering. And she's basically an expert on human gatherings and what, and what to do. And so she has some, some neat tips that she's provided. So one, um, so let me provide a few tips and then We'll see what we can do to begin to implement. One is to understand purpose. If you're going to have a gathering, what's the purpose of your gathering? Is it a celebration? Is it for new people to meet each other? Uh, maybe you don't have a purpose. <laughs> maybe it's merely like we're, I'm just getting together with two friends for n- like nothing, just to be together. Oh, okay, well, I guess there's some little purpose there, but I don't know how you necessarily have to facilitate that. But what is it about? And that your purpose actually then leads for you to understand who you invite, what you do, and where you do it. To actually understand that, okay, if the purpose of this family get-together isn't just for the family to get together because we get together every Thanksgiving, but if the purpose is, is to celebrate and express thankfulness, 
well, should we actually, is this an opportunity to bring others into the celebration? How, how could we help set it up to feel celebratory? Can we give moments to people to share about thankfulness throughout, throughout this? What are we trying to get at with this celebration? What's the purpose? The second takeaway is space. Um, Priya talked to, in the book talked about actually setting a perimeter. So if you go to a restaurant and there's five of you, instead of sitting three facing two, to actually set it up that you, you enclose the, en- the ends. And so it'd be like, it'd be one facing two and then one and one. So there's no open gap at the end of the table. How just doing that, closing the gap and making the perimeter grows connection. And you've set a space now for human connections. You even set an example of something happens psychologically when you throw out a picnic blanket and it's not just an open expanse of grass, but now this is our space. This is our space to connect. It's our space for conversation. We've set a perimeter of safety and security that this is for us to connect now. So how, how do we set the space with a perimeter? To remove extra sitting, that, setting that boundary actually helps hold energy in, which I thought, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, also, size. You know, it's too large and people get lost. But then there's different, depending on your purpose, sometimes you want more people there because some people want to be a little bit lost. And so how do you, and the, the thing about the size of the room, of how you set it up so that it doesn't just feel like empty or stagnant. And so partly what we've been trying to do here, right, is, is play, how do we set up a room to fulfill a purpose? And then talking about, thinking about thirdly, hosting. Connection doesn't happen by accident. That a, a host needs to set a tone and be intentional. Now, I would actually say, okay, what if our big get-togethers as a church family, what if then we're all actually the hosts? What does it look like to be intentional, to actually set a tone in that way? What do you do to be a host, to drive um, the energy and give a sense of what's supposed to happen here together? And she says, so a host has some authority they need to use, but use generous authority. And this is the quote I wrote down. Are you ready? Chill, chill is selfishness disguised as kindness. I thought that was very interesting. Chill is selfishness disguised as kindness. Just to say, oh, I don't really need to direct this or think about it. We're just going to be chill. But actually, that just makes it easier on me or feels safer for me because now I don't actually have to help direct something. And she says, that can actually just be selfishness. Um, So how do you actually love and give generous love as a host to lead the people that you're with. What does that look like for us as a church family to embody the heart of Jesus? Um, pra- so practical, <clears throat> going to land our plane here. Just a couple, share out a couple of practical things for tips. If you're, if you're creating a sense of hospitality, if you're hosting people in, in your home or online, what practically can you do to, to help? So if you've, what, what are some things you can do? Jamie, you're, you're good at hosting. What can you do? What can you do to help? Well, I think it probably depends on the purpose, but we were talking a little bit about how women in particular often feel like the pressure to make it perfect mm. and how welcoming. I mean, it's nice to clean your bathroom before people come over, but like actually if making it perfect is the barrier to not inviting people into your life, and it's, I mean, like I'm have two young kids right now. My house is not perfect. <laughs> but, like, if that's the barrier, then it's better to just invite people in. And I think, I've talked to people before, too, who feel if you try to make things too perfect, then they feel the pressure, like, I can't ever have you over because I can't make it perfect like right. that. And so, actually, like, taking down that barrier and maybe doing something basic for your own sanity, but just welcoming people into your real life, I think that. Mm. Feel free to welcome people into your real life. Don't try to make it perfect. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. You know, I thought just very practical. Like, what what is a practical tip for hosting? Do you think? I think in, inviting maybe people into what you're already doing, or a okay. that you already have, so it doesn't feel like this whole other thing. It will just lead, lead up to or wrap up to some big event. Yeah. Um, like it could be if you always go for coffee at a certain time, or you tend to go for a walk in the evening. Call some neighbors and hey, like I'm gonna walk anyway. You want to yeah. join? Yeah, that's good. Because that could be another barrier, right? Like, I'm too busy. Yeah. But right, so you're already. <laughs> yeah, welcome people into what you're already doing. We're going to go for a walk. Do you want to join? Spontaneous hosting. Right. So there's some spontaneity there, though it's intentional. 
right? It's intentional on your part. It's like, hey, I'm going to go for a walk in a couple hours. Do you want to come? But it's not like you booked it two weeks in advance. Hey, at 2.30 on Sunday, do you want to go for a walk for 45 minutes with me around this park? Right? It's like, oh, I'm going to go for a walk with him. Do you want to come? I think going into somebody's home, there's something about that feels safe about holding something, which is why offering somebody a drink early is helpful. Uh, Priya Parker in her book talked about what you can actually do to host as a team is to have somebody become the water minister. That actually they just ask them to come a couple minutes early, and then as other people arrive, that's what they do. Hey, would you like to do this? There's also something about if it's new people connecting, to kind of set that tone of one of the things that I, I love is for people that I love to be able to get to know each other. So the goal before we eat would be, can you make a new friend? And just sets a tone to, hey, we're all going to be doing this together. Have you ever been to, gone to visit somebody new, like a barbecue or something at their house, and you don't know anybody, and other people know each other, and like nobody talks to you except for the host, but they're also hosting everybody else? And then it just feels like this anxiety on you. Well, maybe for some of us are extroverted. You're like, well, hey. But uh, for some of us, like myself, I'm like, oh, okay, so I have to choose who to go talk to and make small talk now. But actually, as hosts, and doesn't that feel like if you, jo- if you step into a new church community, can that be daunting? What would it look like if those of us a part of the church family became a team of hosts? So, no one, so that people don't walk in feeling like, oh, everybody knows each other, and I'm the outsider, and I have to go and figure out who to talk to. But what if we all say, hey, before this goes on, I'm going to try to make a new friend. Um. I was thinking, too, if you haven't hosted people to start small, oh, don't, good. don't think you have to have 20 people over the first time you have somebody into your place. Yeah. Don't start too small, where it's like one-on-one, maybe two or, uh, two, two or three people at least. Right, that's a great tip. Yeah, knowing, try to manage it, right? If you're, I don't, yeah, yeah, that's good. Of course, yeah, like you just have them over for, like, whatever you're making, like, at the time, like, Don was saying, you don't have to do a whole extra thing. It's like, hey, we're making dinner this time, just stop by. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's simple, that's good. I think that I've noticed different people, if we have, we're, I'm going to wrap up here for time, but you've probably gone to certain people's homes where they greet you so well, and then they do exits really well. It's uh, like, a, hey, welcome in. We're so glad you're here. Can I take your coat? There's water over here, and you feel like I've been welcomed. I've really been welcomed in. I didn't just walk in, and everybody's just sitting in the corner already at the couch. Like, I've been welcomed. And then when they're leaving, like, hey, I'm so glad. And this is where the huggers, right, they always stretch me because they're like, hug when you come in, hug when you leave. And I kind of feel like, oh, that was really, that was really nice. But then uh, also, I'm not a hugger, so I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta grow in that, right? But there's something about being welcomed in and then, and that's where working as a team can be so helpful. That's maybe if somebody's cooking, that somebody else is there ready to actually really, hey, come on in, welcome. I'm not just distracted, I'm here with you. You're, you're here and you are, you are welcomed um, here. I like music in the background or different things. You can set a, set a vibe like that. There's, there's neat candles. There's little things you can do. That, that's great. So <clears throat> um, here's the thing, I guess, that I, we want to land on, and then we're going to receive communion. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Love at full stretch. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Um, City Lights, could we be a people who are willing to love at full stretch? Could we be people that are willing to show hospitality, to be creative, to lean in? Could we be a team of hosts together? Um, I think there's many people in our world and city that do need love. They need a welcome. And what if we could be the, the hands and feet of Jesus, the open arms of welcome tangibly to somebody to say, you belong, you're loved, um, you, you're welcome to come on into relationship. I think the city needs that, and I think we can do that together. And so could we, could we in faith posture ourselves in that way? And... As I mentioned earlier, um, Nuver and Don, you can come on up here. <clears throat> the communion elements are here. And these, this is a representation, a symbol of Jesus' body, the cracker, his body, the juice, his shed blood. And you could say then that these, these elements are symbols actually of the most radical, most generous, most sacrificial hospitality that has ever occurred. That this is how much 
you're invited in. Uh, this is the risk. This is the pursuit. This is the extent. This is love at its fullest stretch. Um, and I think that if we can ask the Spirit of God in this moment, if you're a follower of Jesus, to stir our hearts afresh to experience that, um, then we're actually going to have a fullness that we can respond to, let that overflow. It's not that I'm trying to be a good host or have people over my house because I should, but it's actually love. It's love that I've been filled with and it's love that's beginning to stretch me. Um, and there's nothing that says love more than what these symbols represent. The God who is love come in Christ to meet us who are his enemies, to welcome us into his family, to say, hey, you're welcome here. You're home. Could you stand? Spirit of God, we just, we open our hearts to you together today. We say, would you come and would you move in us even now? For those watching online, for those in person, we want to have a fresh awe of you, Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus. You haven't received his love yet. You can do that today. Uh, Jamie and Paul are in the back corners here available to pray. And you can receive prayer for anything at all, and that could be your step of prayer if you're in person. But Jesus, we want to say thank you. We want to receive from you. Amen.